And our sermon reading today is a very simple one, very short. <clears throat> Excuse me. Psalm 103, 19. And here's what the psalmist writes. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Now, we've been looking at this whole new sermon series called The Portraits of God, and, and these portraits are literally snapshots of God that, that uh, as we look at God's self-revelation to us, we begin to see the fullness of who God is. And God has been very good in revealing self to us through Scripture. And that's the point is that I talked a couple weeks ago that we can believe in the validity of Scripture. Uh, the, the Greek New Testament is, is one of the most accurate ancient documents that there is. And the Hebrew Old Testament is very accurate in itself. But the reality is we have to have trust and faith that that's truly God revealing self to us in the midst of it. It's just still, still a point of faith for us in our lives. Now, last week we talked about God's self-revelation as transcendent creator. God exists apart from, distinct from creation. He's the creator of all and is the life giver. And the pinnacle of creation, of course, not only life, but it was humanity created in the very image of God. Then we looked at the idea that sin came into the picture and what happened? Sin marred that image of God within us and it brought about this thing called death, <laughs> something we don't like. And yet God reveals self again and he reveals himself as transcendent creator again and offering us new life found in Jesus and also that recreation of God's image back within our lives. It's a beautiful picture. Now, today we're going to look at God as sovereign king, which is another aspect really of God in, in transcendence as he uh, reveals self to us because the reality is if I think um, if you're the creator, if you're the life giver, then it only stands to reason that you have the power of governance as transcendent sovereign king as well over the universe, over the world, over our very lives. God has authority to exercise rule and to give law. God can say, this is how life is to be lived. I know I created life. I gave life. I know how life is to be lived. Follow what I tell you to do, and you're going to be blessed. <laughs> Don't do it. It's not going to work out so well. And we're going to see that in the story today and in, in, in God's revelation to us. But God alone is the one with ultimate power, authority, and sovereignty. So that's why we use that psalm, that first psalm, Psalm 103, 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. I'm just going to take a quick look through the book of Isaiah. This could be anywhere in the scripture, but we're going to start with Isaiah. And we're going to see God revealing himself as king, as sovereign king, the one with all power and authority in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 6. Remember, well, some of you remember, I... I a couple years ago, preached about two months on that passage about God's holiness. But the, Isaiah 6, Isaiah steps into the temple one day, and he has a vision of God. God shows up. Everything's quaking and shaking. He says, I looked up, and I saw the Lord seated high upon the throne. The king, the sovereign one. You go just a little bit farther into Isaiah. Isaiah 14 says this. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I plan, so shall it be. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. You go a couple verses later. For the Lord of hosts has purposed it. Who's, who's going to cancel it? My hand, he says, is stretched out. Who's going to turn it back? I'm the one with all power, all authority. You go a little bit farther. Uh, Isaiah 46, or Isaiah 43, 13 says, From eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can snatch you out of my hand. No one can undo what I have done. Isaiah 46, do not forget the things I have done throughout history, for I am God, I alone, I am God. There's no one else like me, only I can tell you what's going to happen before it happens. Everything I plan comes to pass, for I do whatever I wish to do. I could stand up here and do this all day for you folks, but I'm not going to. God has revealed self as sovereign king, the one with all power, all authority, the one who sits on the throne. It's a beautiful picture. Now, we sometimes have trouble seeing God as sovereign king because we live in, in a, what we know as a democracy. We live in a, in a republic where the branches of government are split. No one has all the power, executive, judicial, uh, um, uh, uh, legislative. They're all different. But when it comes to a sovereign king, all those are the kings. He has all power, all authority, and does whatever the king wishes to do. 
Now, as I mention this, I think there are four, I guess, thoughts that come to my mind in the midst of God saying and revealing himself as sovereign king. Number one, God has all power. Okay. Number two, God has a kingdom, which means there's a sphere of authority. There's, there's a place to reign. There's purpose in the midst of it, and there's values that God has in the midst of that. Number three, here's a big one. We are created beings subject to God. Did everybody know that? I know it's hard for us to get a hold of sometimes. We are created beings in our lives, in our creation. We are to be subject to our creator, King. And number four just goes right along with that. We are called to surrender to God, to enjoy the love and the benefits of God and God's kingdom, to live in the righteousness of God's kingdom. So every week when I talk about these things, I want to deal with the, just the reality of life for us. I want to deal into very uh, applicable things into our lives and maybe questions that we might have. And here's, when I start talking about God as sovereign king, immediately I have questions. And I'm guessing some of you have questions too. So let's bring them out there. My first question is this. If God is sovereign, why doesn't God act to cause certain things to happen or stop certain things from happening? He's got all power. Why not? How has a good God allowed bad things and horrible things to happen within the world? You ever heard that one before? As a pastor, maybe 150,000 times I've heard that. Or take it more personally. Why did God cause this thing to happen in my life? I don't know. See, this tension begins to come about where there's a combination of free will in the midst of this world and God's sovereignty. God averts some things and allows other things to happen. Sometimes God intervenes in a situation. Sometimes God doesn't intervene in a situation. I start asking questions like, well, are we just robots? Do we have no will or no, no choice in the midst of it? And if that's the case, then I can't be held accountable for anything, right? Because I couldn't help it. I mean, that's just the way it is. Or maybe is God not powerful enough to change something? See, all these questions begin to come up because God says, I'm sovereign king and ruler of all, and yet I look out and see issues and problems and things going on in this world. You know, the philosopher Albert Camus, he wrote the book The Stranger. I call him my favorite existentialist, even though he says he's not an existentialist. Of course, he's gone now. He wrote this, and I think this is very interesting. He said, life is the sum of all your choices. That's what life is. It's just the sum of your choices. That's, there's no purpose in it. Of course, he didn't really believe in purpose. He didn't really believe in, in anything but freedom and free will, just do whatever you wanted to do, and even kind of blurred the lines of right or wrong. Well, is there really a right or wrong? There's nothing there. Is that how we think? Is that how we're supposed to think? King Solomon put it this way, we make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Maybe that's the right way to think of it. John Calvin, you know, Calvinism holds to a whole idea of, of predetermination and determinism. And he says this, free will is the faculty of the reason to distinguish between good and evil and the faculty of the will to choose one or the other. So I'm going, wow, I don't know, what, what, what do we do with this idea? So here's my thought to it, okay? Like I told the first service, I said, if you want to go throw it in the garbage after you hear it, that's fine, that's fine. But here's how I see it in my thought in the midst of it. Just because God has absolute power and authority and sovereignty and a purpose, I believe God has purpose, does not mean God has to exercise sovereignty at all moments or that God causes all things to happen. Does that make sense? I used a silly example. All analogies break down. I know it. But let's say it's a beautiful summer day, unlike today. It's a beautiful summer day out there. And there's an ant walking down the sidewalk. As I come up to this ant, for all intents and purposes, I have complete sovereignty over this ant. I can take out a piece of paper and make him go to the left. I can make him go to the right. I can turn him around. I can make him climb up and knock him down. I can lift up my heel and go squash. I could, anything I want to do. But I could just sit there and watch him go on his merry way and carry out his duties and go, isn't that nice? See, just because I have power to do something doesn't mean I have to exercise it all the time. So God says, I have all power and authority. It doesn't mean God exercises it at all times in every situation for everything. See, the Bible is amazing in how it intertwines God's sovereignty and our free will. And it's hard to get a hold of because 
horrible things happen in this world, don't they? Horrible things. And we go, God, why? I don't get it. I mean, the reality is the curse of sin, it's a, it's a son of a gun, isn't it? It's created a, a world and a fallen, broken world where bad things can happen and harm can happen. And yet God just lets the world keep spinning. And here we are. So the two points that I want you to see in this today are an act of love and obedience. And I truly believe this. For there to be true love in this world and true obedience, there has to be choice. There has to be choice to have true love or true obedience. Isn't that what you want? You want to go out and find a a spouse or someone to love, right? You go, oh, I want to find someone who loves. And, and as I love them, they, by free will and choice, love me back, right? Isn't that what we want? And if any of you are out there trying to force somebody to love you without will or choice, it's called kidnapping. Don't do it, okay? <laughs> Allow them to love you. See, that's what we're here for, right? Choice. In order to have love, we have to have choice. In order to have a, a free uh, chance to, to choose what is right, there has to be a choice of choosing what's wrong in the midst of it. I went to a liberal arts college, and in liberal arts colleges, you take a lot of classes that you wouldn't normally take, like a couple of philosophy classes and different things like that. In one of my philosophy classes, the professor said something very profound that changed the way I think of things, and here's what he said to me. He was talking about in Christianity in the midst of philosophy, he said this very statement. He says, we have to have faith that God created the best of all possible worlds, even though it's a world that allows for choice and a world that allows for sin. Because to have true love, there has to be choice or sin. To make right choices, there has to be choice. To, 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 to um, have joy in living, there has to be choice. You know, what's God's greatest commandment? Anybody tell me? What's the greatest commandment that God says in the Bible? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. To choose to do that. Not to be a robot, <laughs> that you have to, but we get to choose it. I believe the God of creation is a God who has purpose in all of his creation. And God has a purpose for our world. God is bringing it to a conclusion. God has purpose for our very lives. And if we submit and surrender and are in obedience to what God has for us, he will bring it to a beautiful conclusion. I say that because I really believe Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Even in the midst, while we're dealing with our free will in the midst of this and our choices and we're dealing with the problem of sin in this world and in our lives, God is still sovereign enough to make things happen for us. Does anybody believe that? That no matter what's happening, that God is still sovereign enough that if we love God and we, we, we are obedient, God will break all things work together for our good. See, that's something we can hold on to. A sovereign king. So let's take it a little farther. Here we go. Here's what God wants to do as he reveals himself as sovereign king. Let's just go back into the Old Testament. Let's look at the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and after that was Joseph, and then Moses comes along. In the midst of this uh, whole scenario, Israel, God's people, are slaves in Egypt, okay? They're over here. And God says, I want to set them free. And he says, Moses, you're the one who's going to do this for me. Moses says, but who are you? How am I supposed to, what name am I going to give them when they say, who, who is this God? And here's what God's answer is. I am that I am. Verb of being, indefinite article, verb of being. That very word is a causative verb. I cause, I act, I make happen, and you know that I'm God. I'm involved in things. I'm interacting with you. I'm causing things to happen so that you know who I am because I have purpose. And God delivers his people from Egypt, right? And he delivers them, and he says, you're my own possession to live under my direction. And, and in the Exodus, God reveals himself truly as king and as Lord, and he is the theocracy is what they call it, where God's the one in charge. And it's not until 1 Samuel like 8 and 1 Samuel 12 that they kind of reject God as being their king. And they said, we want a, an earthly king that we can see like all the other nations. And God says, you don't want to do that because there's going to be a mess. And they go, no, we want to do that because we think we know what's right. Anybody ever said that to God before? I know what's better than what you know. 
and it turns out bad for them. It really does. See, in Exodus 19, God enters into a covenant with his people, says, man, I'm, I'm going to carry out certain responsibilities. I'm going to lead you, protect you, help you, bless you. I'm going to meet your needs. And in chapter 24, all the people agree, yes, we will follow you. We're going to be obedient. We're going to surrender our lives and allow you to lead us. Because as sovereign king, God gets to establish moral order. He used to say this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And he even sets up rewards and punishments for it. Like in Deuteronomy 6 or in Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28, here's what God says. I brought you today to the crossroads of a blessing or a curse. The blessing, if you listen obediently, if you're obedient, you do everything I've asked you to do, the commands I'm giving you, man, you're going to be blessed so much you can't even imagine what it's going to be like. It's going to be so good. But on the other hand, the curse, I'm telling you, if you don't pay attention, if you're not obedient, you know what's going to happen? It's going to be a bad, long, hard road. I'm laying it out there for you. Which one are you going to do? You know, Isaiah 48, 17, and 18 says this. This is when the curse is hitting them big time because they weren't obedient, they weren't faithful. And here's God's words. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is good for you to do and leads you along the paths you should follow. Oh, that you would have just listened to my commands. Then you would have peace flowing like a gentle river and righteousness rolling over you like waves of the sea. But you don't have it. Right now you're in the midst of the curse. You chose poorly and you were disobedient. See, that's the reality of sin today, folks. God, sovereign king, what's sin in the midst of that? It's very simple. It's rebellion. Rejecting God's authority and God's rule and God's word, and it leads to acts of disobedience. It's an unwillingness to submit to the one who has ultimate authority and power. I love this picture here. It says, human nature summed up in one picture. Are you ready? Do not climb, play on, and or around the pipe. Every single person in that whole lake is what? On the pipe, right? Is that not us? Here's the rule. Don't do it. Okay. <laughs> right up to it. I mean, look at them all lined up on there. Isn't that hilarious? I said, that's, that's human nature, disobedience, man. That's what we're about. I won't mention the name of this group. There's a popular group that I hear on the radio um, in more of the rock genre uh, <clears throat> of music. And they're self-avowed Satanists, but they have very popular music. And I don't mention it because their music is very melodic and, uh, and it'd be easy to listen to. And their lyrics are they're evil, but you don't really overtly see it as I've read through them and go through them. So I don't even mention the name, but one of the songs about it, it's literally a song about uh, Satan's fall to the earth. And one of their, their lyrics is this, you wear your independence like a crown. And I, and I think, oh, doesn't that just sound like us? Our independence, our disobedience, we wear it like a crown, like we're the ones, we are the creator, we're the ones who have th this. We forget that we're created beings, created beings to be subject to our creator king, to follow what God says to do and who God says to be. See, humanity is created in the image of God. We have a mind, we have reason, we have emotions, we have a will. And in a perfect world, these are all surrendered to the creator king. But as we find out in Genesis chapter 2, what does God say? You can eat anything of this in the garden, any tree out here except this one tree right here. Stay off that pipe, okay, is what God says. And what do they do? <laughs> By chapter 3, what are they doing already? <laughs> We're eating from it, right? Because that's us, disobedience. Boom. They disobeyed God's direction, God's law, God's word, and what comes with it? Consequences. God says a blessing or a curse. You see, the curse is the consequences that come with that disobedience. There's a curse of sin. There's separation from God. There's paradise lost in the midst of all this. And Adam is the figurative head of humanity that means to pass this broken nature onto us. And now, now there's anybody here ever feel like you might have a little bit of a rebellious nature or disobedient nature within yourself sometimes? Where God says, this is what I want you to do, and you say, no. Anybody ever done that? It's there, isn't it? It's that fallen nature, that human nature, that flesh is its called. You know, Paul in Romans 7, 
17 to 20, and I won't read this all for you, but you can go home and read Romans 7. It's a powerful passage where Paul says, I, I know the law of God is good. In my heart, I want to do it, but the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. What a wretched person I am. Anybody ever felt that way? It's like, man, I know what's right. I know what I should do, and I don't do it. That's wrong. I shouldn't do it, and then I end up doing it somehow. What is wrong with me? It's that fallen nature. What a wretched man, Paul says. What can we do in the midst of this? Well, the reality is this. He says, thanks be to Christ Jesus. We're broken free from that. And in chapter 8, he talks about life in Jesus and life to follow Jesus and be, or to follow God and be obedient because the Spirit of God is leading us. That it's impossible to please God if we're led by that fallen nature. But when God's Spirit is here, it leads us to live the right way. We live in a strange time, folks. We live in this tension of two kingdoms together. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And that's why I read that passage out of, out of 2 Corinthians right here. First, 2 Corinthians, where did that come from? I don't know. Out of Ephesians chapter 2. Man, we were all dead in our sins and transgressions. And we used to live, we followed the ways of the world, that kingdom, that, that fallen, broken world, right? And it's at work within all of those who are disobedient. That's us. All of us lived like them. We gratified our cravings of the flesh and followed the desires and the thoughts. And we were deserving of nothing more than wrath. And yet, because of God's great love for us, and he's so rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ when we were still dead. And it's by grace that we've been saved. You see, that state of rebelliousness and disobedience, that state of not surrendering to God or living subject to the sovereign Lord and King, it separates us from God. So what does God have to do in the midst of it? God intervenes and brings us back. He brings us back. He gives us pardon and welcomes us back into the kingdom as he is king. And he gives us a way to look, begin to live and, and walk in obedience again to what God wants us to do. And here's where I see it first is it, the beginning of the gospels is found in Jesus. Mark chapter 1, 14 John the Baptist is put in prison. Jesus comes proclaiming the good news of God. And what's the good news? The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, what's a kingdom? God, sovereign king. He has a kingdom that we're supposed to be involved in. He says, here it is. It's at hand, right here for you. This is what you need to do. Repent and believe. You see, it's our choice to repent, which means to turn around, to live differently, to be differently, to act differently. It means we understand that we need that forgiveness. We sin. We're out of that right relationship. It's our desire to be back in the right relationship, and then it's our active response of turning and changing the way we live to be in that right relationship. We are also called to believe, to come in faith and surrender to the King and Lord, to come back and live under the rule and authority of God as sovereign King. See, Matthew 4, 17 starts the exact same way. Jesus starts his ministry, and this is what he says as he begins the ministry. He says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. But here's the most amazing thing that Matthew does. From right that point, he goes to chapter 5 through chapter 7. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is basically the ethics and the values and the lifestyle of the kingdom. And Jesus says, here it is. It's time to repent. The kingdom of God is near. And this is what the kingdom is all about right here. And there's like three whole chapters of just good, good stuff that we need to get into our lives of how to follow and be obedient and carry that to completion. In the middle of that is Matthew 6, 33 that says, seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, which means I seek first God, God's kingdom, God's practices, God's values, God's ideas, God's purposes, God's mission, they all now become number one for me. I now step to a place where I'm aligning myself with God and his kingdom and everything God wants me to do, and that's my obedience in the midst of it. That's who we are. But the only way to get there is to become persons who are fully surrendered to God. To be persons who have an entire consecration of our lives and a full yielding of every area of our life to God. So my question today is this for you. Where do you need to let go of disobedience in your life? Where do you need to let go of rebellion in your life? Where is God asking you to simply surrender to the sovereign king? It's not as easy as it sounds, I know. 
But here's what God wants for us. And we're going to play a final song right here as the band comes up. I believe this is what God wants for us. If we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and don't lean on our own understandings, but if we just acknowledge God and God's direction and path, he makes our paths straight. And that's a powerful thought. So today, as you look through and think through those three areas, where is God calling me to surrender? Where am I walking in a disobedience? Where am I walking in, in some kind of rebellion against what God wants for me? And to understand the blessing is to come back in obedience again.